Okay. Ms. Kemp? Here. Ms. Martinez? Here. Ms. Bates? No, I Mr. Matt Bowman, Paul Bowman. Here. Mr. Gussenberg. Here. Ms. Harrigan. Here. Mr. Martelli. Here. Mr. Neff. Here. Ms. Nichols. Here. Mr. Pangaro. Here. Mr. Perugini. Here. And Mr. Talbot. Here. We have the board present. Ms. Bates. You know who you are. So when the camera comes, they will. The camera comes. I please stand the pledge. Write it all right down. I just like to the flag. Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Orleans. Yeah, I just want to make sure it's on my because that's twice on. Ex officio, Mr. Orleans. Oh, I think the best for No, I just want to make sure the record shows whether I was here or not. All right, so first up on our agenda is the tour of Dodd. So we're gonna, first up is to get out of our seats, and I'm not sure who's leading that, Jeff. Is that yeah. you? Or? Well, uh, thanks, Anne-Marie. Yes, we have a special tour guide with us tonight. Uh, we thought that it would be nice to have the administrators from each building kind of take us on the tour and kind of give you the ins and outs of the facility, uh, things that are you know, really uh, working well for us and some things that maybe we're looking to enhance. So with that, I'll pass it over to our principal here at Dodd Middle School, Mike Woods, and our assistant principal, John Parasino. Good evening, everyone. How are you? It's a, it's a pleasure to see all of you. Um, we actually will start the tour. Um, I'll actually, what we'll do is we'll start with the group um, down in our foyer. So if you guys want to join me, you can go right down to our foyer. You can stand on the Spartan, just go right outside the library and take a left, and we'll go on our little walking tour. So thank you very much, everyone. As uh, Jeff said, my name is Mike Woods. I'm the principal here. I've been principal uh, coming up on uh, eight years. Is it really? Yeah. Seems like Trust two. Me. Seems like two. Yeah. Seems like two. Um, so I'll be leading the tour and kind of going through. Also, uh, Mr. John Parasino um, is kind of going to be in the back. So if you ever have any questions you want to ask me just for the entire group, or if you have any wonderings as you go around, you can also ask John. Also speaking tonight is going to be Rich Clavet. He's the uh, director of our facilities. Um, so he'll be kind of giving you more of the technical um, elements um, of our building. Um, I, think, I think some things to just kind of give you um, an overall highlight. Um, you're going to see a lot of the places in which um, in our building we're trying to refresh. This is our latest refreshment that we had. We uh, had the ability um, to come out and get our great uh, mascot to be embedded in our tile on the floor. We tr really try to freshen up our um, foyer as much as we possibly could. It also came with a new ceiling and we're in the process right now uh, of enhancing a, a lot of our security features. Um, we have a plan to kind of redo our front entrance way as well. Um, for more enhanced securities as well, and that's going to be uh, is through the grant. Yes, so, yeah, yeah, so that's the security so. grant that PBC's undertaking. So we still have some ongoing things that we're looking at um, for a lot of safety and security. We've done some measures um, right now. Um, if you are a Dodd parent, as you know, we always say you have to make sure you bring your license. You know, signing in with your license, buzzing into the uh, to the door. And I will say, as much as uh, as an inconvenience, sometimes it may be. I will say the community has been wonderful at hearing. Um, to our request about um, our security enhancements. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to kind of we're going to take a walk down here. We're going to be going up on the second floor and kind of flanking our way back. It's just going to be a big circle. Um, but going through the hallways, I think some of the things you're going to be seeing, depending upon where we are, um, you may see some ceiling tiles that are discolored and those types of things. We already have put in a spec for um, a new roof um, that is kind of in the works. Um, as much as we try to repair it, um, we're very fortunate right now, I knock it on wood, um, but during the winter months when we get snow up on the roof and we have ice and we have shrinking and thawing and, and expanding and those types of things, we do get some seams in the roof in which we do have some water leaks. So from time to time, um, you may see um, ceiling tiles that are discolored. Um, I will tell you that we have done a, a refresh um, as, of, as early as about uh, two weeks ago, yeah, this past summer. Uh, we had an order of about 4,000 ceiling tiles. Uh, we've probably used up close to 3,200 of those ceiling tiles already just to kind of give you an idea um, of kind of the condition of our roof, primarily on the second floor and then on the portion, uh, the portion of the building that does not have. Um, so what we'll do is we'll head down our, our main hallway and I'll show you two typical classrooms, a science classroom, 
um, and just a, a standard classroom that I'll be considering this area is known as the old part of the building. Um, and then when we get to uh, the new um, part of the building, new circa 2002, 2001, late 90, 97. Was it 97? Yeah. Yeah, right. Were well, you here? So, um, so, um, your eighth grade? Real nice. Nice. Um, so, uh, so I will be referring to that as the new part of the building. We'll kind of show you the differences between classrooms, um, and you know, we'll start talking about some instructional spaces. So, we'll head down this way. If you want to follow? Yeah, questions at any time. <laughs> There's always a, a middle schooler who is always gracious enough to keep their lock off their locker for the principal every night. I hope it wasn't my son. Um, but what I will say is, is that when you do take a look in this old part of the building, these lockers. Uh, probably haven't been changed uh, probably since the early 80s at best so you will see some of them um, as much as we go through and clean them and, and kind of make sure that things are you will see that they are aged. You also take a look at some of our facilities that we have with water fountains we've been upgrading these as well um, but over the years uh, you know this one actually does give us a problem from time to time but we are upgrading some of those as well with the proper masonry work that's going behind them as well so we're trying to do things when we when we are fixing things, we are trying to do them to the best of to the best of our ability. So, this classroom, um, I would say, our, our math, uh, language arts, and um, uh, social studies classrooms in the old part of the building. So, the equivalent of about two teams or six classrooms um, are typical of this size. Uh, while we have upgraded technology-wise. Um, here, you know, just the actual physical space of this classroom, as you can see, as, as much as we're upgrading our furniture, sometimes they get a little bigger, it does get a little tight in here. Um, I know when I'm walking through doing observations and stuff like that, you know, you're, you're always kind of doing the sidestep. Um, so I think in some of the, the modern classrooms that we've seen, there is a little bit more space. Um, you know, even if I was to say, hey, look, if we were to, you know, expand this just like about five feet to get a little bit more room, um, for whether it be storage space or whether it be for uh, more classroom openness. Um, this classroom is kind of, it's kind of contained in a way that um, we really can't do some of the more modern practices of collaborative teaching. Um, we're limited in how we can rearrange some of our furniture just for fit, you know, for fit purposes. Uh, but like I said, we have uh, made our efforts to uh, modernize everything as well. As you go through some of these classrooms too, you're going to notice that on the walls there's a lot of these white strips that come through uh, conduit some of it has been painted already some of it hasn't um, that is because some of the original elect electrical work that's embedded in the concrete traditional like in your home um, doesn't work so we had to rewire some you know a lot of our classrooms um, with some existing uh, that was a network drop and in the back of the room you'll see a lot of conduit around we had to rewire classes um, because the original electrical um, is not working as well so the size of this classroom is ballpark? Uh, I want to say these are just about, um, yeah, just about, it was this one, I think these are 620, we have four different sizes. This is the smaller one at 620, I think 625. And typically how many students would be here, in here during the day? Right? We try to keep class sizes at about 22 to 24. Um, so. Um, another thing that's missing in here um, is HVAC. Um, I know Rich and I will talk a little bit more about that. I know the first time we had gone through, people had said, you know, is it just because of air conditioning? I think with air conditioning with, um, and with heating, um, there's also that element of moisture control as well. Um, when we go on to our uh, east side of the building, uh, we'll talk a little about some of the moisture issues that we are having there as well, uh, that potentially an HVAC system, a system-wide HVAC system um, can maintain. What we're doing right now, just to kind of cut the edge on the hottest of hot days, is that you will see um, we do have some window units. That's one of the older original window units, not spec'd out for a space this size by any stretch. Um, you will see in some of the other uh, classrooms as well, those AC units with the hoses. Um, again, not spec'd out for that size, but you, you hit that price point of like, do I wanna spend $800 on one unit or get the right unit for about $2,700? So, you know, it, it's just enough to keep the edge off. And the reason why we kind of went that route over the last probably four years was because there were times in here at, at Dodd um, we averaged about 10 school days in which we had to put a heat contingency plan into place, which was essentially moving our classes the way our schedule rotates, moving some of our upstairs classrooms um, down to the downstairs where it's a little bit cooler or moving it into a lecture hall where there's air conditioning. When the lunch waves are done, we kind of move some classes into the cafeteria just because the air movement is a little bit better in there. 
Um, so we haven't had to do that. This will be the first time. This fall was the first year in which we didn't have to do it. Uh, we usually think when the, when the temperature hits about 91, 92, um, you know, 90 by 9, we're usually putting that heat contingency uh, plan in the place. We didn't have to do it this year just because the AC units and talking with kids and teachers was just enough to kind of cut the edge of the heat and we were able not, you know, we didn't have to put that into place. So. You have all single pane windows? or the Yep. Pane? So in the old original part, um, these are the single pane uh, windows as well. Um, in the old part of the building, excuse me, in the old part of the building. Um, so, at any given time too, um, sometimes, you know, depending on the rooms, um, you know, sometimes the heater, the heat valve controls, I don't know, Rich, you want to talk a little more about that. Um, our heat valve controls aren't regulated uh, very evenly. So I do know sometimes teachers will, you know, we control the heat sometimes by opening a window, cracking a window here and there. It doesn't help the grand plan of things, but um, sometimes things really do get um, a little bit warm um, during the summer months. And then uh, there are times in which we've had some issues where um, if the heat uh, system is, you know, the, depending on how we monitor the heat system, um, if it's not working these classrooms very quickly in an overnight in the winter time, you'll come into probably a high 40s, low 50s degree classroom. So yeah, most of this building is still uh, running on 1970s uh, technology, pneumatic, which is compressed air uh, for heat control. So it's, it's all air compressed, uh, compressed air that controls dampers and uh, hot water valves. So it's very, it's non-reactive. takes a long time for it to modulate. So. It's specifically noticeable when you have a very cold morning and then a warm afternoon. You know, there's still a lot of residual heat in the building, and it's just it's uh, difficult to control. So yeah, the so windows often, offset we'll, that. Yeah, you'll you'll every so often hear the hiss. You know, yeah. you hear the hiss going white. Conversely, if it's a 70 degree afternoon and then uh, it's a Friday, windows tend to be left open, and then uh, by Sunday morning it's uh, 15 degrees outside. So. We get notified uh, over the phone pretty quickly that we have low temp alarms throughout the building, so that it doesn't happen too often, but on occasion. Yeah. Do you know when these uh, ceilings were dropped? These ceilings were dropped? Well, it looks like that. Yeah, so behind there, um, they did that for the lowered ceilings. I can tell you when I was a student here, we had the original, we had the beams going through and all that kind of stuff. It was finished, but I know when they, I might have been when they put a new roof on the building years ago. Uh, they might have refinished these as well. And you can tell they were retrofitted because you'll see some custom, yeah. you know, custom cuts around uh, around vent, uh, vents and those types of things. I mean, in original construction, uh, the ceilings are always much higher. You know, 10, 12 foot was not uncommon. Not modern construction today, it's, you know, down to, you know, under 10 feet. You know, 9, 5, you know, just to, so you don't have to regulate that space. It's all that additional space for energy savings. Yeah. And we do, we have upgraded the lighting systems here as well. These are all on, you'll see as you walk through, they turn off motion uh, sensors. And they have also an auto dim in the morning. This, uh, we'll get the, the um, west facing sunlight in the mornings so that at least when these lights are on, they do automatically dim based upon the light sensors that you see uh, flashing from time to time. Yeah. These are fluorescent? These are all um, LEDs. Flat panel LED. All our classrooms, all the hallways, and all our schools have this technology that computer controlled LEDs. There's one control, or there's one sensor for every one of these lights. It does daylight harvesting. So those will dim, and these will be brighter so the light's even. Also has uh, motion controls, so the lights turn on not just for Mike. Anybody that's walking down the hall, the lights turn get those lights on. Um, and it's this was done as part of the um, energy performance contract that we did across the town. So they are saving somewhere in the neighborhood of 70% over the previous lighting that we have. So we've done things in the district, you know, to make us more energy efficient where we can. But things like the HVAC, which are very inefficient, those windows are very inefficient. Those are the big dollars that we put in our capital budget, but we haven't done because we're looking to see if the school modernization plan takes us to where um, we need to be. So that's why some of those larger capital no, items are on here, home. here, then here. Is this a single teacher's classroom? Yep. Are they in here all day? Or nobody comes in with a car? No, we don't, have any, we don't have any teachers on carts right now. And then the setup for the room, does that change throughout the day or should it change throughout the day? Um, yeah, it will. I know, I can tell you, I know they had an assessment here today. So I know she was doing some direct instruction in the morning. Um, and then they had an assessment here for the afternoon. So sometimes that changes. 
Uh, these single pieces of furniture are really kind of, a lot of teachers have switched over. They wanted the two piece again, um, just because you can make tables out of it. And I will show you, um, we do have a couple of our special education classrooms where we've put the modern furniture in, and you'll see a, obviously the stark difference between the two, what you have the ability to do. Mike, you're seven to eight grade only here. Correct. In the prior um, building report, they were looking at those six, seven, and eight. Yes. Do you have any thoughts on that? And the only reason I'm throwing it out now is, you know, one of the ideas is new construction, possibly renovation. And depending on where you fall out on that as a group, you know, we may have different options available. Sure. So, you know, how important do you think is the six, seven, eight? Versus, okay, we can we can deal with seven and eight alone and keep things the way they are in terms of leaving sixth graders in the lower schools. Sure, I, I can tell you from my personal experiences working in five eight buildings, working in six eight buildings, and this is my first seven eight building. Um, I think having sixth grade with the middle school model, um, I think is important. We essentially run the middle school model. When I say that, uh, that's. In layman's terms, kids will switch teachers for different classes, and they are team-based. So you have four teachers um, on that team, and the kids are rotating between that four team, uh, between those four teachers. It takes a very large building and really makes it small from the kid perspective. So four of their periods will be with those four teachers, and then we have unified arts classes, our tech ed classes, um, so to speak. Um, I think there's a lot of advantages to that. I think when you take a look at, one, um, what we take a look at for our NGSS standards, our Connecticut Core standards, um, our Social Studies C3 standards, pretty much they have done everything, you know, it's K3, it's 4, 5, and then 6, curriculum-wise, is typically how things are, um, how are geared. So it's designed to have that full experience curriculum-wise. Um, instructionally, um, I can say that teachers too, is typical, we have different certifications and those types of things. We do have a 4-8 certification, we have a 7-12 certification. So that 6-8 six, that six, model allows me a lot of, you know, a lot of rotation with teachers, um, gives you more options that way. From a kid's perspective, uh, I can tell you right now, my daughter's in a 6-8 school right now. I was concerned, you know, about, you know, what about the buses? What about, you know, the 6th grader with an 8th grader? But I kind of reflected back to say, well, the sixth grader was with a first grader on the bus. I mean, that is a sh there's a more stark difference. You know, a ninth grader and a twelfth grader potentially are on a bus, as much as the twelfth grader doesn't want to be on that bus. So when you take a look at those age differences, um, even as an assistant principal in a, in a fifth grade, a six eight, we never really had those major issues if you build the schedule right. Um, I think one of the things, kind of answering your question, renovation or new construction, I can only speak to some of the limitations that we have. If I wanted a 6-8 building here on this site, um, you'd have to know that right now the footprint where we are with the parking lot and everything else, we're at our max. It's not yeah, like I'm, we I'm can expand on. That we, would, we may end up looking at another location. Sure. There may be another building in town that's a current elementary school that could become 6 or sure. 8. Sure. The only, I would so say that... I'm just trying to understand from absolutely. your logistical, operational perspective, it sounds to me like there's some real curriculum benefits to yep. get the 6th graders doing what the 7th and 8th graders are doing where they're moving from classroom to classroom rather than being more stagnant in one class with the younger kids in the mm -hmm. elementary schools. Is that what I heard from you? Yeah. And I think one of the things, if, if that is a consideration, if I, you know, if I can interject just as, as the educator, the number one thing, and I think we have talked about this before, it's, it's the cafeteria. It sounds, I know it sounds really stupid, but right now I run two, uh, two grade levels. I have to run four lunch waves that start at about 10.50 and I'm ending just about at one o'clock. So if you're looking at something else and I gotta run more with the amount of kids, the best case scenario just scheduling wise, because right now we have our last um, seventh grade team that eats lunch, we have a little snack time in the morning for them because they eat so late. If you were to do three grades and now I gotta run six lunch waves, you are running lunch waves for the majority of the day. So that would be the thing is it's the cafeteria. You gotta be able to fit one class in the cafeteria, run a lunch wave for each grade level from that standpoint. From a student standpoint, we have teams and kids that kind of swap from team to team, but we could say you can eat lunch with all your friends from your elementary school, your friend from seventh grade, uh, your friend from, you know, your friend, for, you, you can kind of merge that. So even as from a social perspective, it is a time where all the kids are together. Um, so that would be one thing I would definitely take a look at, because if not scheduling, um, you know, is, is a major hassle if you have to run split lunch ways per grade level. Yeah, then you have kids eating too early or too late. I exactly. Think. I'd have to start at 10 o'clock. You know, I have to start at 10 o'clock. So, so, thank you, Mike. Thank you. Yeah.
Oh, who's the next? Yeah. We have a question over here too. Uh, yeah, I was just I was gonna ask about your ventilation system. Uh, do you have a central ventilation system? In certain parts of the building, we have rooftop uh, ventilation systems that run our large areas. So when we see our, um, we take a look at our band room, the library that you were just in, that runs its own centralized area. Um, but we don't have anything that runs the classroom, the, the, the entire classrooms. We have the, just your, your just heating, no no yeah. ventilation. Right. We do have ventilations on the second floor. We have rooftop ventilators that run, you know, during the summertime on a system. Like air exchangers in the right. hallways. And you'll see them when we yeah. walk through. But most air exchanges are handled by the rooftop units. Yeah. If you wanted to have a meeting with all of your students, can you have them all assemble in the gymnasium and they all sit? We use the cafeteria. Right, currently, right now, between the balcony and the cafeteria, we can fit a grade level. But you couldn't fit seven and eight together? No. Okay. Oh. Even in our gymnasium, we can't fit. So we're, we're going to hit that last, okay. and we'll talk about big spaces need to be a little bit bigger. <coughs> so, Mike, I noticed this is uh, Ms. Cabrera's class? Yes. Yeah. Teacher year last year, correct? Last year. Ms. Cabrera? Yeah. No. She was, she's just, oh, she's one of our math teachers. Okay. I, I think in Castellano. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just, <coughs> I know Mary, Mary a little bit. So in her class, when she's here all day, She's right. a teacher of the year in my book every year. Yeah, I mean, that's a good answer. Get that? You get that? He got it. Well, <laughs> so she's here all day. This is basically her own quote unquote her office. So when she has a full class, I notice the desks are kind of like laid out rank and file lines. Yep. But I imagine throughout the course of a of a course, she might have to break up the students into groups so she can spend more time with students and need a little bit more hands-on help. How does that happen? Here. I mean, are they like going to a corner room, pulling this together, sitting out with Mary and the rest of the group is going off like two feet over we're, we're and doing their work? They get out, and I tell you, we found them. So we we take a look. Miss Cabrera has the round table in the back um, of the class. So that's a circa 19 late 70s uh, brown model table. Um, but we are going back to some of the the furniture um, that we take a look at within the district. Um, you know, we call it Pat's List. Um, one of our uh, custodians, Casilla Exchange. So we're looking to kind of you know come through. Uh, with those meeting areas. Yeah, my <clears throat> question is because it's so uh, tight in here. It is tight. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I wonder if some of the kids are maybe a little disrupted or perhaps the folks <clears throat> that need specialized attention. You know, it, everybody can hear more or less what they'll be talking about. So I, yes. I wonder if they get enough private space so that they don't so worry about, about private Yeah, perception. This is what of, you get. Yeah. <clears throat> this is what you get. And I can tell you this too. Um, I, I hear a, a sense of kind of what we hear as well is that. You know, what if I'm a kid who does struggle a lot and I'm kind of with the teacher a little bit more? I will say, you know, Ms. Cabrera and a lot of our teachers are really talented at making sure that really from a kid's perspective, they're not really seeing it. You have to also kind of take a look at it from their perspective. We've been doing this throughout the elementary school. So when you come to eighth grade, you know, here in math, they're used to it. So if someone is struggling a little bit more, you know, that's com why wouldn't you be with the teacher a little bit more? Okay. So there are those elements too, even from a kid's perspective. Sure. Um, I can tell you, talking with my daughter, sometimes it's, it's funny. She's like, "No, but he has an adult with him." Uh, you know, and it's just, it's, it, it's just, it's really, it's really interesting to hear it from the kid's perspective. The difference between space-wise, um, furniture-wise, this is a typical science classroom in our um, uh, for our uh, for eighth grade in the old part of the building. Um, there are some there are some pieces that we take a look at um, in the science classroom a little different. We do have gas in here. Um, I can tell you it's everything's safe, um, but I can tell you right now we you know we have issues with some of, um, of our shutoff valves. You know sometimes we have to use a redundant system um, to you know turn off the custodians are always coming in. Hey, we're turning on the gas today. Um, you know and kind of upgrading some of the features of our gas system. We have to turn it off downstairs which is not typical in a new school. Um, they have shutoffs and emergency shutoffs and those types of things, but because we've had some uh, gas leaks in the past, um, and they haven't been significant, but they, what the, what's mixed with that gas is that mercaptan um, chemical, which uh, really pungent. So even if there is the smallest of leak, you smell that mercaptan, you don't smell the gas, it's not, it's, there's no odor to it. Um, so there are some things that we do have to do um, to shut off the gas to make sure um, that we can ensure that the gas um, is not going to leak. So there are some issues with our gas system. Um, everything's still perfectly safe though, but we just take a couple of precautions to ensure that we're not going to have any issues. Um, you can see storage space for a science classroom. Some of our science classrooms do have a side room. Um, 
that um, you know, has a science prep room in there. Um, you can take a look and see at some other uh, typical safety features. We do have the chemical wash shower over there. Um, one of the things in which we would like to take a look at with the new um, next generation science standards, some of the curricular elements in there do talk about um, some chemical mixing and those types of things that we right now can't do in some of our classes uh, because you do need those big hood vent fans um, that you see in those chemistry classrooms um, that you'd be able to do some of those curricular elements. So there's other ways in which we watch videos and watch the chemical reactions happen and those types of things. Um, so there's a way for us to get by, but it would be nice to get the kids working as a hands-on uh, element with that as well. So, any other percolating questions? Michael, <coughs> so, notice the uh, speakers are taped over. Um, for that area? Oh, is it just to keep it quiet? Or? Yeah, to keep it a little bit more quiet. Some of the modulation with the volume on some of these speakers is a little, a little quirky. So. All right. Are these ceiling tiles um, bowing because there was water there at one time? No, it's, that's the overall air moisture in our building. Um, and like I said, when you utilize the outdoor you know, air to kind of ventilate some of that, um, you are going to see some of these that will bow from, you know, from time to time. So the winter time, they actually kind of come up a little bit, so these actually look pretty good. So. <laughs> these look good. We're going to come out. <laughs> We're going to come out and take a right, and then uh, John will meet right down in the uh, end of the hallway. There's some, uh, there's some other elements in our building um, that when this was renovated and was built, there was, some, uh, there was some design elements in here that did have something that was you know, just beneficial as a school in general. So whether they be just uh, teacher sub-conference rooms for teachers and phones, um, whether it be um, you know, small copy areas, um, you know that we have for you know teacher offices and those types of things um, once they built this the population of Cheshire went up so those spaces had to be reconstituted and we had to be a little bit creative so um, behind over there by Ms. Harrigan um, you know we had to turn a storage room into a Xerox copy room you're also going to start seeing in our hallways we're already packed capacity um, from time to time and, and you know we, we, we get the blessing from the, the right people in town um, you will see some things in the hallways, you know, or in a stairwell or something like that. We have a copier that's in the hallway upstairs. Um, so we are kind of bursting at the seams um, even when we go through all of our storage. There really wasn't a lot of storage area designated. Um, and then some of the areas that were designated for teacher class, excuse me, teacher offices, we've had to turn into small tutoring classes. Um, I, there, there's one that we'll see upstairs and you'll see it's just not it shouldn't be an area for learning. It should be an area for what it was intended for, copy rooms, teacher conference areas, you know, if the teacher needs a private phone and those types of things. This is pretty much from these two ramps. We're actually going to go up the stairs here and then head over um, and then we'll come back down on that end of the hallway. This would constitute the new wing of the building. Um, so there are some things in which you will see that are a little bit, it seems a little bit more um, up, updated. Um, you also see we're also trying to go through, we can't do it all at the same time, but some different colors. So this is kind of the blue part um, of the wing. I'm trying to do my best to see if we can get back to our original colors of, of red and white um, <clears throat> and trying to bring some of that color uh, throughout uh, with trim work and those types of things. So we do have an elevator over here, so you don't have to take the stairs. Yes. I thought we were going to carry it. Since we're in a corner, um, what, are, what are the conditions of the life safety systems of the building, such as? Fire protection and fire alarm. All of those are up to code yeah, and are inspected, code. Uh, fully inspected yeah. annually. Um, and then you'll also see, not in the new part of the building, but the old part of the building, you'll still see some of those inlet with fire extinguishers and those types of things. Those are all tested. What do, you, what do we have? Fire drills uh, 10 times a year? So we have, well, once a month there's a, an emergency drill. Seven of those should be fire and fire and evacuation, and right. three of those are, are deemed more or less our lockdown drills. And then That's prior to the start of the school year, uh, the fire marshals along with facilities, we do walkthroughs of the building, identify non-conformances, you know, repair them sometimes, you know, right, uh, right on site. But, um, you know, as the years go on, we, you know, address all the non-conformances, sprinkler coverages, things of that nature, emergency lighting. Right. Uh, actually, this year we just completed Darcy because there were some, non some long-standing non-conformances there, so th that's ongoing. We try to keep up with the codes uh, as best we can. Do you have a generator? No. Well, the only, the only school that has a generator is the high school. And that's only for the front service. We 
did do the upgrade though, so that yeah, um, there, is, do a a there is the ability for Dodd to be hooked up on the generator. Yeah. Are the teams all grouped together? As best as I possibly can. So um, it wasn't designed. No, as you can see, I think if you get the opportunity to take a look at uh, more modern buildings, design elements are a lot different. It's very rare that you're going to see a building with long, straight hallways. Um, just by Two essence of design, um, but also for security purposes as well. So um, you'll see kind of, uh, it moved uh, probably about 15 years ago more to a pod kind of concept um, where you would have five classrooms that would constitute a team. We're a four person team. In the ideal world, they all say it on care. I would love to have a five person team, and that includes attaching world language to the core, uh, the four core areas as well. And there's a lot to do in that to get that together. Aside from school activities, are there any like community events, activities, regularly held for college? Yeah, so we have, we partner up with the YMCA, we partner up with um, the music. What's that? Park and Rec. Yep, Park and Rec. Um, we also have the community. Um, uh, the community orchestra also uses our band room for those types of things. So that is used readily. Primarily our large spaces, um, you know, our, our gymnasiums, our music areas, sometimes our lecture hall from time to time um, as well. On the second floor, I'm going to have you guys you can, uh, uh, enter into the classroom. You'll notice, you'll notice that the size-wise obviously is a lot bigger. Um, you'll also notice in this hallway too, you can kind of take a look around. Lockers, <clears throat> these are the newer lockers, but we have noticed with middle schoolers, uh, having a long, narrow locker, if you were to see this at uh, arrival and dismissal, the hallways get a little bit narrower. If you have long, straight hallways, those are your options. When you take a look at some more modern schools, they have kind of locker banks and locker areas, not necessarily right directly in the hallway. So there's still the ability for some safety features if you take a look at that concept as well. So feel free to take a look at one of the newer classrooms and we'll take it from there. No, you'll notice we have a combination here. So we have an air exchange unit in here as well, and we also have uh, the side base. So it's so, pulling, uh, fresh air from the outside. It's a unit ventilator, yeah. yeah. has a hot water coil in it, also can draw outside air for... This space is much more comfortable. Yeah. Standing here versus the other one. You can yeah. feel the difference. Yeah. Yep. The other one was stuffy. Yep. Res yeah, you get the residual heat that comes up through the convection radiators in it. You can't control it. In this classroom, like I said, we've been kind of putting things together um, just for HVAC. It's up that, that window unit probably won't even take the edge off of my, you know, your living room at home. Um, yeah, I like the but, two by four. But, sure. Hey, that's some classic 1980s design right there. Um, but those are uh, at least in this part of the building, even though they are double pane glasses, uh, double pane windows here a little more insulation. Um, we have been noticing there have been some issues even with some of the, the, the fit and finish of some of these. Um, downstairs on these heat ventilation units as well, um, of course they don't make these anymore. Builder Special, um, and two years ago, we, this is where when we had the water pipes break, they were breaking inside those uh, ventilation units. So, um, so there's just some things that we still have to go through upgrading existing things um, that we have to take a look at. Uh, been, I should say we've been ongoing as well. <coughs> this is 96 edition? Yes. Mike? Yep. Yeah, so these windows are coming, going on 30 years old already. So. Did this uh, used to be a double? It looks like that was that's just know, how the, the, the separator. Separator. walls. That's just how they did the walls. Does this open up? No. I know. It looks like That's what it looks like. That's why no. I was asking if it was and then it's, uh, it's, it made it permanent. Yeah. Yeah. Not the best in town proof, but... It's a wall. Is the forecast for students to go, number of students enrolled down to go up or go down? Uh, we're, we're kind of on a down slope right now, and it looks like if I was just going by actuals right now, first in kindergarten, um, this year's kindergarten, this year's first grade, we're seeing a little bump up. When I say bump up, it's my, for me to say a bump up, it's about 50 kids. So I'm losing about 25, 30 kids. Um, for the next about two or three years, and then it flattens out, and then it starts bumping up. So I do see a, an uptick. I didn't see the, I forget the number of what I saw the other day. But that first kindergarten, first grade, currently right now, looks to be a little bit of a bump up. Yeah, when uh, Superintendent Sloan did his presentation, he showed the projections from uh, NESDAQ. NESDAQ. So and NESDAQ show, is, yeah. we're starting to get to that level off point, but you see a little trend to get my figure out what the tickup looks like. So I think when you guys go through the process, I just know this from the last time, um, you guys take a look at a 10-year average. 
And that's how you kind of figure like, well, if we're going to build a building, how do we know it's not going to overflow, which is, which is exactly what happened here. I'm at 636, I think, when Jeff was uh, an administrator here. Uh, principal assistant principal um, he was Jeff were you over 900 kids here yes so <clears throat> so you're talking about a pretty significant you know population mm -hmm. decrease that's been going on for a while what do you have now say it again Mike we're at just over we're just about 636 um, I had a question unrelated sure how does it look above the ceilings uh, do you have a lot of room or is it pretty tight uh, it's there's probably about a two and a half foot plantum up there. Okay. It's not super tight, but you also have structural, uh, you know, cross cross members in there. So kind of, if you were planning on doing any intricate uh, ducking or what have you, right. it would be a little tough. But wiring, yeah, you're, you've yeah, got plenty of pipes going up there. Yeah. Um, those types of things. And then it's the roof deck right on top of that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we're on the second floor, so yeah, this uh, EPDM roof. Kind of taking a look at. Um, this furniture uh, we've been purchasing for the last two years. I do have the monies and the capabilities of kind of furnishing. Uh, this is a special ed classroom. Um, special ed classrooms, uh, instead of some of our unified arts classes, kids with IEPs um, have what we call iBlock. Um, it's a strategies class, so they're working on their skill levels and those types of things. Those classes are typically a lot smaller. So at most, you're talking anywhere from eight to 10 students, about half the size um, in this room. Uh, kids can be working on several different things. Um, they can be working on between, you know, all different subject areas. They can be working on executive functioning skills and those types of things. When you have that as your kind of base of what you do, um, it makes sense to kind of have different elements of furniture uh, to do that. So as you can see, these individual um, desks can, you know, be separated uh, easily enough. Um, when we order them, we order them with the felt bottoms too, so they slide along on the floors pretty easily. Um, we did have the ability to order kind of a, we call that our reading nooks. So we have reading nooks in all of our special ed classrooms as well. Um, you can see one of the newer uh, AC units that we have uh, used. That our facilities guys did a great job in kind of fabricating um, the window insert. Um, so it's not, at least we use pressure treated on this one. So it's not the two by four. But, um, and then you can also have the ability of some adjustable height things. Um, some of our students, you know, sitting all day is not a good option for either the child or the teacher. Um, so they have the ability to, you know, utilize higher, um, higher uh, desk heights um, and those types of things. And then you also have the ability to have modular tables as well that you can separate for small group tables or bring them together for just a, uh, a larger group um, uh, instruction environment as well. So. I would say in the ideal classroom, some of the schools that I had toured, the entire classroom has this kind of furniture um, so that you have the ability to, um, uh, to modulate and you can make different shapes out of these um, as well. You could actually turn these inside and get that old, um, the old bean style tables where the kids sit on the opposite side and the teacher could be in the middle and kind of the center of instruction. But I think having this varied instructional uh, environment and with the space that you have the ability to do that um, you know I think it's a luxury that we have a reading nook in, in every single uh, of our special ed classrooms but it would be nice to have some of our, our classrooms our regular ed classrooms to have some of these features as well so you're not using this furniture in a, in a regular full classroom no I can tell you the cost to do this um, like I said I could probably do two special ed classrooms or one regular ed classroom in a year just with with uh, fi you know finances um, so I'm trying to do I'm almost done I got one more special education classroom to do uh, which I'll hopefully order this year uh, with this year's money um, and then uh, you know kind of finish that out then we got to think about you know what it is uh, you know what's going to be our next step to update some of our other classrooms as well furniture and flexible seating is a real demand for our teachers you know we got to educationally across America we've gotten away from sitting in rows and it's much more collaborative work and mixed group today I'm with this group tomorrow I'm with that group so we need that flexibility and you need a certain amount of space to be able to facilitate that flexibility uh, that's a, a primary uh, item for a lot of our staff and I know there are some teachers who have in our in the older wing who have kind of limited space you know, we do take a look at furniture options. We did test this um, out and kind of said, can we fit all of this? 
even this furniture that does look smaller and you have a smaller space with a two piece with a two piece where there's that one piece is, is stationary you really can't do much with it um, even this in our older classrooms it's still very tight sticking 24 25 of these smaller units inside um, one of those classrooms you can fit in the teacher's desk or you're fitting a workstation for uh, the smart board is just you know there are some problems with that so would the other teachers like to have a layout like this oh yeah oh absolutely everyone was coming in here they're they're, they're <laughs> licking their chops so i'm saying I'm gonna take the, you know it's a new I teacher do. i know <laughs> what does this typically cost um to do this classroom with the couches and everything else about fifty five hundred dollars Fifty five hundred. Yep, fifty five hundred. How many classrooms in the building? Uh, total right now, we're at about 62, 60, 63. So, my question yes, it, it was yeah. <clears throat> so regarding smart boards. Let's see the first one. I know that our budget actually it was in one of our uh, curriculum committee meetings there night, Marlene uh, gives a presentation on a different piece of technology. It was one of the mobile touch screen LCDs, and can we ask a some few questions? Sounds like these smart boards are starting to come to the end of life. Want we'll to talk a little bit about that? And Mike, would you mind expanding? I don't know if you're going to talk about technology. What would be the ideal technology setup? I'm not sure if smart boards are played out. This is sort of purpose. I think they do, but. Look, th this was this was kind of that when these came out, and we what we had the ability we got to figure one from overhead projectors and PowerPoint on a on a TV that was mounted in our corners to having something like this that displays the learning was fantastic. But the concept of displaying the learning and I'm sage on the stage has kind of started withering away. It's more even out of the curriculum that I had talked about downstairs. Those curriculum organizations set the lessons up so it's not me teaching and lecturing um, it's kind of the middle school lecture is kind of a bad word um, ideally I've seen a couple of things that I I find to be a little bit more intriguing I'd like to know more about what is out there I'm not quite sure but I know in some where this, you know this um, is not stationary so I have seen places where it's not just the smart board on this but the entire this entire whiteboard would be interactive so you can take these and slide them down a little bit. Um, you could have your teaching, you know, in one part of the room. You can do an investigative part of the room. You can have kind of a lab situation with research in another part of the room. That's kind of how it has, you know, where, where it would have to go. What is the tech solution on that? Tough to say. I will say, like even the teachers right now, these are not becoming as, as, the, as important because in a one-to-one -one environment where every student has their Chromebook, the teacher sharing that with the student. Uh, we want the teacher to you know, step away from this, but as you can see, this is pretty captive. You have your stationary um, desktop right here that's linked to the smart board, um, and we're trying to get teachers to be more you know, out and collaborative. Who's doing the work? When you go into a classroom, who's doing the work? And if somebody's just standing up there and talking all the time, it's usually the teacher who's doing the work. And so we've been, you know, as we focus on complex thinking, how can we support students engaged in critical thinking and problem solving and application more? Um, and there is a place for direct instruction, no doubt. Um, but really, how do we get kids working together to solve problems, apply what they know? And that's really been a, a significant point of emphasis for us. So getting away from a singular focal point of instruction is what we've been doing uh, gradually over the last several years it's kind of timed itself well with these being um, you know, coming to an obsolete point. Yeah, the only thing I'd, I'd add to what was already said is right now this is two pieces. This is a this is a replacement projector. This board's probably 10 years old. So this is the interactive board. You can actually write on this with these pens. The teacher can save it, send it out to the class. The newer units. Um, and this was about $5,000 set up, including installation. The new units were actually piloting. There's one in the Hummiston boardroom. Uh, for about half the price, $2,500, we got a flat screen monitor. Still has the interactive capability. Uh, and it comes on a rolling stand. So you don't have to keep it right here in the front of the classroom. You're still linked to a computer, although there is some broadcast technology that will allow you
to roll it and use it in different places, as long as you have the electrical outlet, which is required. So and the space, we, we saw that at the Board of Ed uh, Houston. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it does, that stand does take a fair amount of space where you park it, so that's a consideration. And I don't want to board a, the community longer, but as I heard too, that so many smart boards due to the age, uh, you know, the, the screen is yawning a little bit. They peeling, delaminate. Delaminate. They fail. And how expensive are to replace the bulbs? They still like that. <coughs> the price or well, a the bulb on a projector, if it's an old style projector, is a couple of hundred dollars. So, I mean, we could go with LED projectors, which are more expensive, but really we're at the point where, you know, the, these boards at 10 years plus of age, they have to be replaced. And that is one of the things that we looking for Mr. Solon on the, you know, what if we had additional funding, we would invest in the replacement of these smart boards with the, a newer technology. The newer one that we're testing, by the way, in the Board of Ed also uh, has Google Chrome built in, so, you know, a teacher can, you know, take their smartphone and just scan their smartphone barcode and it logs them in you know, to their Google account, which every teacher in our district uses. So there's some built-in technology advantages, and it works on Google Chrome. We are a Google district here in Cheshire. And so I've seen technology, and we talked about some of the even, some of those two will actually come with the equivalent of uh, some sort of iPad device um, where you can actually have students, hey, really quick, show the class. The student doesn't even have to get up and draw, they just draw the iPad as a mirror of the smart board up front. So there are technologies that gets that technology out mobile. I still think large group instruction, there is a place for it. It's just not the center and backbone of learning um, anymore in pretty much any of the environments. Um, you know, and I'm, as I'm taking a look right now, I know what's going on at Quinnipiac in which they're going through that transformation um, with learning as well. Um, but it's at all levels. It's happening at all levels where the kids really are more um, in working in collaboration with teachers. And in a school construction grant, you know, for renovators, new and new construction, technology is an eligible expense. You know, as long as it meets the state's parameters, it is eligible for reimbursement. So, you know, if we're at a 36% reimbursement rate, you know, that technology is eligible to be included as part of that 36% reimbursement. Is furniture treated the same way? Mm -hmm. And both, so it doesn't matter if it's new construction. Well, Manners, but construction yeah. or like new renovation. Furniture, you know, is, is eligible. And again, if you exceed whatever the state standard is, that's on, on your dime. But if you stay within the state's parameters. Okay. My only caveat is things change over time. So by the time we apply for a school construction grant, whatever right. rules are in place yeah. apply. Would this furniture qualify? Sorry. Yeah, I believe so. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you look, and I know that there's a committee for outside visits, they'll see, you know, what some of the new classroom configurations and furniture are, and that's all part of eligible cost. Um, are we in need of any technology to accommodate ADA requirements, such as speakers, headphones, or, or are we up to speed on that? Uh, we don't have, I know in, in, the, in a modern school, in a new construction, every single classroom will be with the more or less what we call an FM system, so they wouldn't have that every teacher is wearing the microphone. Uh, we don't have that unless they are, they do have a Section 504 plan or it's on their IEP to have that type of um, device, um, but that's, all of that is mobile here. So it follows the student throughout the years. Yeah, I mean, as a general statement, our ADA compliance, you know, in the physical structures of the building is clearly a deficiency. That being said, when it comes to addressing student needs, we have comprehensive individualized education plans and <clears throat> if a student needs an FM system, they have an FM system. It's just not built into our infrastructure. Right. <clears throat> as you can see from our <coughs> illustrious handicap students, <coughs> you've got to walk all the way pretty much across the entire <laughs> like part of the spot. So, you know, because we do, I, you know, I, I, not that it's, it, it's not that it's funny, but it's ironic to see two handicapped spaces that are right outside our main entrance right next to a stairwell. In front of two stairwells. You know, so for us to get that compliance, we actually have you know our ramp easement on this side of the building to go all the way across the other end of the building to get in. So uh, definitely could use some upgrades. I know Rich and I have worked to um, engineer uh, where the flagpole, where that stairwell is. We do have a spec in place to, to see if we can't just reconstruct that whole area for a ramp there and those types of things. 
So I think it's high time we, uh, we get going on that. So I am taking a look at cognizant of the time as well. Um, but we'll be heading down the stairs. Um, and then there's, uh, I'll show you just a couple of the large areas. Chuck, have, you got a quick question? Yeah, just a oh, quick question. Um, a grant money aside to actually purchase the equipment and everything, would you say that the school itself is currently adaptable to have it put in place? Like, do you have the infrastructure, the power, everything that you need to kind of get some of this new equipment? It's just a matter of purchasing it. Um, I'd have to go with electrical. I, we, we need to know what the electrical specs are, um, kind of the, the, the infrastructure the specifications we would need. You know, Rich, you would know more about that. There would have to be pretty heavy investigation. I'm not knowledgeable. I think you caveated that if you had the power infrastructure in place, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, then you could just purchase the equipment. We don't know. We if don't that's have in place. that infrastructure in place. You don't have it, or you don't know if you have it. Well, we don't. We don't. Well, like in this classroom, for instance. I mean, you know, for power, you know, we've had to run uh, new circuits. You know, to, I mean, you know, back say back in the '70s, we didn't have all this electronic equipment. We didn't have smart boards, we didn't have desktops, we didn't have, you know, room air conditioners or purifiers. All of those, you know, take a toll on, on each individual electrical circuit. I mean, in this school, I think we got 20 amp circuits, but, you know, 20 amps for each classroom, you know, throw a, a you know, a, throw an electric heater in that, in that gamut and there goes your 20 amps. So you have to, you have to design an electrical system to be able to handle what you're going to do for, you know, your curriculum equipment. And we really don't have that. Could it be done? Sure. Oh, it could absolutely. Yeah. Look into the cost. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we run wire mold, you know, we do what, what we need to do to, to be code compliant. But I mean, a, a, aside from that, in a new school construction, you would never see that. You'd have, you know, it would be all built in. Um, I think one of the things that you know is also important to any school building is having some of these larger rooms to have the ability for programming. Um, even though as large as the space is, we're thinking this is this is a great space. It's probably about 50% of what we need. And the reason why I say that, if you've ever been to one of our band concerts, we talk about how the kids only had the ability to rehearse one time together as an entire group. This group of seating is only about half of our band size. Um, so be able to have a larger space capacity um, to, so that we can, and we can rearrange some of our lessons um, in some of our large ensembles program wise. Um, having a larger space for some of these, the band, orchestra, and choral areas. Um, also having, and when you take a look at some modern spaces, um, how they've transformed um, our music and the music and theater spaces in some of the new schools, um, whether it be from soundproofing, whether it be from you know, the way the ceilings are, are done for sound purposes, um, either vaulting up uh, the floors as well and having different levels, um, more or less kind of simulating an orchestra pit. Um, so these are the types of things in which um, I would also kind of, if, you know, if we were kind of taking a look at a new school, I know I would be advocating for some of these large spaces. Um, after this, we'll take a look at the gymnasium and we'll take a look at the cafeteria um, as well. The large spaces really do need to be large enough to fit your programs. Um, for the purposes that they have. So, um, this part, this wing of the hallway that we just walked down as you were walking down on the right hand side, um, this is in this building uh, a little problematic um, in that this is where the, the majority of our moisture content is on this side of the building. Um, there is some sort of underwater, underground aquifer that kind of goes through, um, but we're constantly fighting the moisture on this side of the building. Um, you will see this is one of the places um, that is uh, year-round HVAC. So you have your air conditioner unit. That's a rooftop unit that's right above uh, the ceiling here. Um, <clears throat> but even with that, sometimes controlling the moisture content um, in this part of the building is problematic. Um, we did have uh, the portable dehumidifier in this yep. room. We, um, we run those summertime. So here, the lecture hall, there's a couple areas where the unit... Uh, HVAC units are either undersized or just not in the right configuration because of air turnover. So we, uh, last year before we dealt with a, a couple of mold issues, last year we ran uh, uh, five KW uh, dehumidifiers in this room and the lecture hall and we had a problem free summer and it, it was relatively humid this summer so mm -hmm. we're going to 
that's our plan moving forward until we can upgrade the HVAC system. Gary, this is our, our cafeteria slash auditorium. Uh, we have the ability uh, to run four of our lunch waves um, in this uh, setting. We have our balcony that's used um, for our large productions um, and those types of things. Um, we do have a very fascinating uh, mural on our wall for the town of Cheshire. We're very fortunate to have that. Um, but I will tell you as, as much as we can, um, when you really think about a cafeteria, what can you do with a cafeteria? I was blown away by seeing some of the new things out there a couple of years ago. Um, as you can see here, um, putting 7th and 8th graders in a concrete box um, with no acoustic uh, help whatsoever, um, it does get loud and you just get kids who are getting louder because they're trying to hear. Um, seeing some of the things that could be done um, with a large cafeteria area. Um, I did work in a school that was a little more modern than the cafeteria. Um, we had almost double the size in one cafeteria, and I still, to this day, this is the loudest cafeteria I've ever been in all my career of 20 plus years, um, because there really is no um, acoustic help here whatsoever. Um, so there are some things I think that could get done. Um, just to, you know, when you think it's, oh, it's lunch, it's lunch, but I think it is a part of the day since um, we don't have really any sort of say downtime or recess like they do in the elementary school. <coughs> I think if the decibels were a little bit lower in here, I think the kids would have a better experience. Um, I would also kind of make a pitch as well, just whatever the size of the cafeteria is, you have to make sure the size of the kitchen serving area and the kitchen preparation area are also size adequate. Um, because if you have to feed all these kids, and by state code, uh, state, uh, by state um, statute, we have 25 minute uh, lunch periods. We can't have kids coming out of the lunch line with only five minutes left to go. Um, so that's something too, just kind of getting kids in and out. Um, and obviously with the kitchen staff, having the ability to um, prepare the foods in an adequate amount of time so they're not coming here at 4 a.m. in the morning uh, because of the uh, equipment and the size of the area for preparation. Questions about this? The other area I was going to take people to was the, uh, the gymnasium. I'll kind of talk to you. There is an activity going on if you want to kind of peek in the doors or we'll open up a door for you just so you can see the size of the gymnasium. Currently our gymnasium um, is the equivalent. It's, it wouldn't be sized as a varsity um, size gymnasium by any stretch. Um, there are some bleachers that are there but not really a, of a major capacity. We do have a mobile wall that closes down so that the gymnasium during the day becomes two instructional, uh, instructional environments. During the um, warmer months, we have the ability to use outside as instructional environments as well. Um, at any given time though, um, we do need three instructional environments um, as our current model is set up. If that were to increase, um, you know, we'd need another instructional environment. So currently we have our two gymnasiums. We have our fitness center, and then the way we rotate our health and kids going into health classroom, that also counts as kind of an instructional area. If I had the ability and kind of basing it just upon lunch waves and going through, I think there are some ways in which we can expand programming, potentially without expanding staffing, but increasing opportunities for kids to have some other experiences with our, um, our unified arts, the old tech ed. Um, there are some ways in which we can do that, but we also need the right adequate size um, for instructional spaces for the gymnasium as well. So I have seen some schools, even at the middle school level, where you have uh, your main gym, your varsity sized gym with auxiliary gyms off of that, which is about half the size, more or less like a rec room um, as an instructional space as well. <coughs> some middle schools as well, um, even with some new standards that are going through, um, also have some sort of exercise and fitness area. Um, that's included. We do have a fitness room here at school. We, I was just in kind of short of time. Um, uh, we do have a fitness room here that, like I said, they do use as an instructional space, um, but that would be something in which not only I think is it's just important for our standard core classroom sizes, I also think it's adequate for, for, for educating the entire child for some of the fitness elements as well to ensure um, that those sizes are, are specced out right as well. Yeah, so just to, to close really quick, I mean, I've had some small conversations as well. Um, you know, this is a, I can tell you, if you interviewed any staff member, um, this is a bill that's it's, it's endearing to our hearts. It's kind of like, it's our home away from home. 
Um, I don't have people around here that, you know, come in here and they call a thing a piece of junk or anything like that. But we've had opportunities to freshen up our building. We have. I think you're sitting in the crown jewel of, of freshening up. We had a library media specialist who retired. We had a new library media specialist came on board. Um, it was a refreshing whirlwind to come in um, to see some colors. We're doing some things um, to freshen up through painting and through um, just kind of modernizing some of the pieces with the technology. Um, it's a staff that really um, cares for the building. Um, as you can see, and Rich Clavette and his crew did a fantastic job to make sure um, the place is clean. Um, I think one of the things in kind of switching from carpets to tile, uh, we did have the uh, fortunate um, uh, opportunity this year. Um, we actually got a four Zamboni, so our, you know our two maintenance guys, you know, will crank around the hallways to make sure um, that it's clean. It's a well cared for building. Um, it's just that that you know we do uh, any person you ask to it's 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 a well cared for building but what are we carrying it for at this point right now um, I know there are people around here who believe that we are at the precipice so you know it's good bones there's a lot more that's out there uh, and they would say that you know based upon their teaching style and, and what our kids have an opportunity for um, we do think there are some things that we can do to improve and that's what we're always looking to do here um, as a part of the Dodd family. So if there are any other questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them at this time. Um, we did talk about some programming. We did have a, a culinary program here that has since gone away, um, kind of behind some of these elements too. Um, like all of our buildings, there's also asbestos. So anytime we would like to be able to kind of do something um, in the building, we always have to check and see at the top. Usually it is. Um, one of the reasons, you know, asbestos could be anywhere from the actual wall board itself. In some areas, it's in the adhesive of some place. So um, the tiles that were underneath some of these floors um, were also asbestos. So we've had asbestos abatement in here from time to time as well. Um, we just know that that cost uh, is, is more significant when you uh, tap into anything around here. I have a question. Um, from the needs assessment that was done in 2017, yes. the top priority in there seems to be the ceilings, the windows, and then some outside um, issues with, you know, chop it low. Yes. Not sure how much flexibility yep. you have in improving that. But of that, I know we talked about replacing all the ceiling tiles, but you said the roof itself hasn't been. I think the ceiling tiles were just more of a symbol, as you can see one here, um, is more of a symbol of the fact that the roof does need to be replaced. Right, so they, they, they re, that's more of an aesthetic fix. We're still potentially going to get the roof still leaks. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. And I think when you take a look at that, people would just, I mean, when you really look at it, it's the shelf. You know, it's the roof. It's the windows. Um, you know, anything that we can to get a little bit more um, environmentally um, sound for, for, for teaching, I think that's where people's focus primarily was. Climate control. But, you know, as we, yeah, and as we took a look at, you know, we could put in a, the greatest air conditioning system in this building, but the point is, it's going out the window, literally and figuratively, um, because we have a lot of single pane windows that aren't going to do anything for us. In, in your opinion, if all those things were fixed, the roof, the window, the air conditioning, so, those are all things that can be fixed, but we still have certain square footage in these buildings and the size of the classroom are what they are. And you see the educational programs 10 years out. Do you see possible maintaining a good level of education here with the physical space? Uh, with the physical space, uh, we've been making do with what we have. I think you have the vast majority of the people around here knowing that there is something more, something that's a little bit better, something that can enhance um, our educational experience for our students. That's what we want. Um, you know, if there, if everything else was fixed, I think it's there's a question about the physical plant, um, energy savings, and all those types of things. Um, but then there's also that question about programming. Um, you know, what are the benefits of a six-eight school? Um, you also bring in the factor of safety. Um, not that the school is unsafe, but there are safety measures that are now out there um, that make a building that much safer. So, um, you know, in my opinion, um, do I think a, a modern a modern building would be more beneficial? I do. But I, I think the best example of what we're talking about is, so you still have that footprint of the size of those classrooms. You cannot put those nice. Um, furniture that 
that you can still configure type. in different ways. You can't do that in those right. in those small classrooms because you can't fit 24 or 26 of those. That's, that's <coughs> what what's, what's the delta on the square footages that these are so small? Is it how many? Vinny, does, is there anybody can answer that question? I mean, I think the we're in the six to seven hundred square foot range, and if you were doing a new school, you'd be in the thousand square foot range. But now the state has standards for that. I I don't know what they are specifically and for I want middle to say they school. Were just under a thousand, I think our science rooms that we had spec'd out in the last one was just about nine sixty, and then the regular size classroom was just about in the eights. Yeah, I remember it was larger. It was the Science. Square, square, uh, you know, regular, I think, the square footage per student. How about the regular classroom for mm -hmm. English and math? And I, I, want labs, I want to say they were in the eighth, because I mm -hmm. remember we were futzing with those numbers a little bit to come, look, you know, when we took a look at the uh, cost per square foot, we were kind of saying, could we take each classroom, drop 50 square feet off each classroom, still be within the state configuration? Thank you. Anything else? Thank you very much, everyone. Thank really you appreciate for it. I know we have a discussion about the facility. Um, if you're down, I'd like to do it now. It seems to make sense to me if that's okay, and then go on to other businesses. Is there any other, no one says they have any other comment, um, questions, but does anybody have any comments um, or any further discussion on the building itself? Uh, to accommodate is six, seven, eight, uh, model <clears throat> number of classrooms here. Now, you don't have any extra classrooms in this building, is that correct? No, we do not. I'm going to turn to Mike because I don't know if there's any empty classrooms. So, but how many how many more classrooms would you need to bring all the sixth graders to this building? Um, it would just depend upon what the NESDEC figure would be. So, you have to do a 10 year average. But if I was going by current configuration, you're talking about just the core classrooms, and I think we configured an extra four uh, tech ed classrooms, so to speak. Um, so if I'm looking at that, that's uh, 16, about 20, it was about 24, 24 classrooms. So in doing that, then assuming you can do that, then the infrastructure with facilities, with gymnasium, band room, you know, all the core facilities is, is woefully Inadequate. Inadequate. You couldn't feed them. Cafeteria. Like the <laughs> and on top of it, <coughs> parking. Would, parking. I mean, unless I mean, there were there was some talk about um, just even you know athletics off-site versus being here. You know, do you go and tap into that? Um, I saw some configurations where you expand a wing out into the. The only place we go is into the athletic fields. Um, the problem with that northern that northern entrance out at water, there's a ton of there's a lot underground there, um, and I know when they had talked about trying to expand that, moving those, um, you're pretty much digging up the entire the entire north end of the building um, to make the kitchen bigger, um, and I think there's there were some code uh, you have to I don't know if, Vin if you knew there were some code elements to that to make the kitchen bigger based upon you know based upon those sizes. And I brought the point too, six lunch waves here, you're starting at about 9.50, you know, 9.50 in the morning uh, for lunch waves. Yeah, I mean, there would obviously have to be some creativity. I mean, you probably do, you couldn't connect buildings. You probably have a large atrium that bridged the street, maybe a big area to, so then you really start your building on the athletic fields and, and go north. Madison High School has a second story walk over a bus ramp where you then go down to where the cafeteria and gym are. I mean, Something a, like you're talking about. You know, thought anyway. yeah. The difficulty in, in <clears throat> this footprint of the property is we have about somewhere around 10 to 11 acres. You know, the new middle school standard is about 30 acres if you do six through eight middle school. And you need that much space, not only for the athletic fields, but for your parking. <coughs> for your driveways, you do want to separate bus, pedestrian, and car traffic if you, you know, could, right? Those are some of the things that wouldn't be incorporated in a new facility that were being designed today. Is there any elementary school that has that square, that footprint currently? 30, 30 acres? Yeah. yeah. The only one is Doolittle that has that size. 
property. <laughs> How about Norton? <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't know the acreage. Of, I mean, Norton's not nearly that big. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could we yeah. be provided with a bird's eye view of acreage of each school going forward? Yeah. Put yeah. it on a poster. Yeah. But I mean, on a poster, yeah, so we can, as we talk about it, we can visually. That would help, would help me anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Probably a little more like what markers, yeah. things like that. <clears throat> we actually we do have it. It's it's in that shared folder, but I could print it out. You know, I'm on some on a post twenty four on some large paper, so right. especially when yeah. we visit the schools. You know, the town the town see. has those. Maybe the town. Uh, it's on the stuff on the town GIS website. That's mm -hmm. right. Maybe maybe yeah, church. Maybe, the, maybe you guys can print those sheets. Sure. To show the building, the parking, yeah. all the attributes that yep. may be important. So we all have visuals of. of each school, so you know you, we'd understand. They forget an addition there because mm -hmm. you just don't have the property or you know whatever. The thing with that is, <coughs> you know, we're able to you know get creative and expand sixth grade. The additional traffic, I don't think our neighbors would be that much happier with us as they are now. There's a lot going on in the streets. The schools and the loading and the day. Yeah, drop off in the morning. You know, people are queued up at water. Everybody knows that routine. <laughs> Current group. Yeah, and I think you have to remember too, Dodd, I mean, it had several additions and, you know, it started out as a one story building, I believe. And so as the buildings expanded, we never increased all those common spaces. So, like a library, as Mike said, the cafeteria, you know, you've not, couldn't do it. That's why it wasn't done, but you've never expanded those common spaces. Not unusual. True of a lot of our schools, you'll see that as we go through the elementaries, you have that, that same limitation. So, so that's a consideration as we go through the uh, the planning. So are you suggesting that, that we as a committee don't really give a lot of time in thinking that this this building, this facility, this property could host a six, seven, eight middle school? Yeah, I think that's... <coughs> Seems yeah, I don't think you can do that. Just the property alone wouldn't accommodate that additional grade. Even if you could physically, like if you could build a skyscraper type building, I still your limitation still is, you know, parking in your driveways and your field limitations. Yeah, so the limitations that we're talking about though is the five, six or six, seven, eight of the whole town right now. He said that he had worked at another school that was like four through eight or even Five through eight, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Mike. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so why, Canaan public schools. Yeah, why are we limiting to like sixth grade, I guess? Is well, I can tell you in New Canaan, they had the building size for a five eight school. Uh, fifth grade ran as an elementary model, and then six eight uh, ran as the middle school model. So the fifth grade was actually, and that actually was on its own separate bus route. It was on its own, you know, kind of ran as its own building, had its own principal and those types of things. It was just housed in the building. Mm -hmm. So from program wise, it was still a six eight building program wise. Gotcha. So sixth grade is the cutoff for running like a and like, like I said, it, type of I class. think primarily curriculum design that's out there for all the subject areas and the Connecticut standards all have everything kind of six eight as a six eight mindset. Six eight cluster. Yes, yeah, six eight continuum. So when you take a look at our math, you know you have your pre algebra, algebra, algebra one. Um, when you take a look at um, when you take next a look gen at science. These, yeah, the next gen science standards has. You know, its elements, the C3 framework for social studies, as the areas of the world that they study, but and, and kind of in that same <coughs> element right now. We struggle right now a little bit trying to collaborate with our sixth grade colleagues about who's covering what and those types of things. I think if we had the ability to be under the same roof to collaborate more, there'd be some benefits there. Got it. So my follow-up question to that though was we're still talking about six, seven, eight as the whole town. I mean, being a good school you know, good bones, there shouldn't be a reason to limit the idea of having a six, seven, eight in two different buildings. Yeah. The, you know, the reason I think that we talk about um, under one roof is also efficiencies. So, you know, when you can bring the more kids for the grade level that you can put under one roof, the more efficient we are with staffing. So, I mean, Chap Chapman versus Highland is an example of this. So if you have, um, you know, 36 kids, let's say, and, you know, 40 kids, are, are you looking at three classes 
at Chapman um, <coughs> that are very small, um, where if you have a greater volume of students, you can just average them out easier. There's just an efficiency of scale that occurs when you have a full grade level under one roof. The last place, you know, in, um, in terms of development that, you know, I think is really optimal in terms of an educational situation is sixth grade to bring a class size together that big. Otherwise, you know, at the elementary grades, you know, we do like the community school um, environment. I think our parents really appreciate that, uh, that it's more of a community school environment and it's a little bit more personal. Principal knows your child's name more than likely in a, in a school that size. Um, when you get to a school with any more kids in it, it's, it's harder to do that. But that is one of the one of the iterations that the board looked at in the first master plan was um, keep this building, take Darcy and make that a six through eight magnet school. So, and it could specialize in, uh, the discussion at the time was for STEM. So you would have two buildings with six, seven, eight. The reason we were talking magnet school in particular is the magnet school um, reimbursement rate was much higher at the time. It's, High as 95 percent in prior projects that were done in other districts, so that was a consideration, but it really didn't take hold. But it's it's certainly an idea that can be considered as, as, yeah, I think, as part uh, of the options. You kind of have an open slate. But we um, there were also some parameters about having a certain percentage come from out of town. Right, so at a magnet school, that is a requirement for that, that financing, that you would have to open it up, and there would have to be students enrolled in, from other towns um, to qualify for that funding. I would open choice fit into that, that we have today. I know where Max is. Yeah, the paying. problem is, and it, it stinks, it's the same catchment area. So for our kids that come from New Haven, that's a tough, tough shag. They're up, our kids are up early now to come from New Haven. Uh, as I, you know, being a principal at the middle and high school, you see the matric students matriculate up, that they get to middle school and it's, all right, we can do this. You get to the high school and it's, you know, 7.30 start. You're leaving the, your bus stop so early in the morning to get here, it becomes really tough. It'd be nice if we were tied into Waterbury because it's a, you know, short trip over the line. But that's you predefined into these areas. So uh, I hope if we were to open it that we would be able to fill the seats. But it might be a challenge based on past experience, unless we change the time schedule or something. It's dictated by the state that we correct New Haven. Yeah, that's they have like catchment areas. So we work with New Haven in terms of that program. Lately, what's going to happen with Magnet, and I think we're going to talk about this in the legislative committee meeting next week, is state funding to Magnets has been starting to get pared back yeah. a lot. You know, it's, I'm not sure what those percentages, but it wasn't like it was several years ago where we are going to hire a percentage, not just for building, but for in the school, if the state's going to put more money away from them and back into the public school. So, I don't know if this is politics, but there's a funding problem happening, affecting them to now. So if you opened a magnet school that didn't meet the quota percentage of out-of-town students, you lose funding or something? Well, I don't think it would be approved for the funding because the state would want to see some planning, gotcha. you know, and some evidence that you could fill. And I don't, I don't know what, I don't remember what the okay. ratio was. Was it 40 percent, 50 percent? If it helps the committee, we can help get that information in case they want to look at it further. Yes, Rob. So if we're, if we're still focused on six through eight, should we be looking at the schools that we already have and try to figure out what of those schools could be renovated to accommodate six through eight versus a brand new six through eight? I mean, we're going to try to compare both options. It seems to me we should try to look and see what would be the best choice for a renovation to accommodate six through eight. I know Doolittle has plenty of property. I don't know that's where we want to start. I know, Paul, you kind of brought that to us attention a while ago, that that had a lot of excess land with it. 
do we want to take a look at that? Or how do we want to analyze the remaining schools? I, I think this building is a non-starter for six through eight for so many reasons. Um, just, I think more than anything else, it's just not big enough. The property, it's congested. I think it would be a big burden on the neighbors, even if we could fit it. I'm very comfortable if we kind of suggested we shouldn't be looking at this school for a large expansion. That's why I asked the yeah. administration what yeah. Yeah. were on. Yeah, so I'm just kind of following up on that. So, you know, if this isn't that place to do it, which school could be a place to do it? And, you know, maybe we want to look at Dulo. If and what do we do with the students at Dulo? Correct. Yeah. Obviously, I mean, there's yeah, other options. You know, process. we've got to figure right. that out as well. But, you know, it seems to me this committee really wants to take a hard look at a couple of options. Renovation is new versus new construction. Try to figure out what those potential you know benefits or or, or when, not are. So when the board was going through uh, these discussions with the, the architect, I forget who it was Perkins Eastman. Yeah, um, we talked about. I don't remember if it was too little. It might have been that if you were going to do something, uh, this is like still there's enough space in the property where you can build a new building in another part of the property without affecting the kids. I don't know if Doolittle fit that whole, but that's something to consider. I think it's a worthwhile. Well. I think we were talking about that. School. I, school. I, school. I think it was. I know that was the biggest one. The high school property. Yeah. Yeah. The high school. Yeah. One and then oh, the high school. Yeah. Yeah. So you build a new one, you know, somewhere else in the property, yeah. affecting the day to day here. I might be what it looked like. The other thing I'll throw into the mix too is, if this is not a large expansion project, or three. And let's just say economically, a six to eight, and everything else the community decides to do with all the other schools doesn't fit <coughs> uh, a reasonable budget for the town. And an option was to renovate what we have here, keep it seven to eight. I guess for Mike, if we kept it seven to eight, I guess when we look at what would you want to do differently here, and is there space to go out extra root space for the classrooms, labs? I mean, it's something to consider down the road. Yeah. If that was an option, I'm not saying it is, but yeah, I, you know, yeah. I know it's not getting to tonight. It's not sitting here until tomorrow morning. Um, no, no, I mean, <laughs> I think one of the things that in any of those options that you said, I think you're alluding to it. Something that I remember they were calling it TSK. We call it swing space. Swing space. So if I am going to renovate this building, you got to get swing space. I can't. Mm -hmm. I think at the time, Jeff, when you were principal, they were doing some construction here. Don Malone has told stories where they're, you know, the, the ceilings are hanging wires and, you know, those types of things. If you're renovating while school is going on, you're talking about a major disruption. Um, <clears throat> again, there's a long wish list in which I would be more than happy to share. My first concern is, though, is where, where are the kids going while we're renovating this place? And I know in one of the, I think we came down, you, put, you, you guys will, you know, you're going to funnel your options down based upon some external factors, swing space is going to be one of the things that might trip us up along the way. <clears throat> the, the original plan, as I recall, had building a new school, which then emptied a building so that you could continue I to move, move people. Right. Um, so, I mean, you know, if, if you can't build a 6-8, maybe you look at, you would build a new 7-8 and empty this building renovate this into a new elementary school or something. Yeah, that yeah, actually was a swing thing. school mm -hmm. for yeah. the other renovations. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, the yeah. And I think when they took a look at the duration of all of the renovation, this building's got to stay online for another you know, 10 to 15 years. So where are we going to be in this physical plant 10 to 15 years down the road while you <coughs> clean space and renovate all the other schools um, that were, look, were on the docket for renovation? Lots to yes. think about. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what's the square footage of the do little do you know? The building? We can find that. I, yeah. I know we have it. We, 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 we have it. Yeah. I'm just trying to remember. remember. Yeah, the square footage is on that. Oh, Perkins really? Eastman. They had all of Yeah, I know. We there. have it. I just Vin yeah. usually knows all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Vin's brain's full cool lately. It's yeah. like. But I think you'd also want to take a look at what is the square footage of the cafeteria of the gymnasium. Because that was designed yeah, to build. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm trying to get a sense okay. of the full Is that an answer? Hold up. Thank you. Um, building size of Doolittle is 73,850. 73,850. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you get that number from? <laughs> a little bit. 
And the, the six to eight model that was designed in the last one was roughly 175, correct? Right. Right. But Lexiana, are you for sale again? <laughs> we should call and see how they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> but the new that's not 25 Correct. That's, that's, why, so that's, that's why I'm focused right. on it. Yeah. So if we can build a new school for six through eight, on the yeah. Doolittle property without impacting Doolittle and then turn this into a K through five for the Doolittle kids to come here, we can renovate this place. Because there's- Just big enough for that? There's 63 classrooms here. Is and this big enough to manage Doolittle. K through five? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah probably. Mm -hmm. And the benefit of the Doolittle property is that it has frontage along Oak Avenue, so mm -hmm. right away it wouldn't be an issue. We just need gas. Well, Gas, it's a whole other. It's an old mother problem. Right, well, we will be at two little uh, when but soon. And Chris, throw in um, over yes. the next five years, it's proposed to spend 1.5 million in new replacements here at that, and 900,000 in new replacements. Right. So, so, so we'll have a plan before that. Well, that's the other consideration when you look at the money that is in the capital improvement of schools and, and projects that need to be addressed and dotted in all of our schools, depending on what yeah, we decide, we those, that money can save money. Well, the, best the, best the best part of this whole building yeah, is there's a lot of money that is spent over the next five years yeah, on yeah, our existing yeah, buildings yeah, without any major improvements. Yeah, and that's just on the building and it's just Right, just to, right. But if a roof's back, <coughs> you can do a roof. Yeah, yeah. 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 especially if you're going to keep it as a swing space and turn it into something else. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any other specific comments, discussion around that? We will be getting to all the schools and obviously we'll yeah, do little traps with, the, with that in mind. All right. I want to go back um, for approval of minutes from our last meeting, January 6th. So moved. Second. All in favor? Um, Thank you. Um, next up, um, we had discussed, I think, about two meetings ago, um, knowing that we were coming out and going to be touring um, all the schools in town, possibly creating some videos of each school building that could be made available to the public. Um, I think we all thought that was a good idea, so wanted to revisit that if, in fact, this committee feels that would be beneficial, so that if so, um, we can get staff working on that. The idea would be to create. Um, my personal opinion, short, like two minutes or less on each building, only because we have eight buildings, and I think it's unrealistic to expect people to sit and watch two hours of video of our schools. But um, if it's done, um, I think it certainly can be done in a way to show the projects that have recently been done, but even just to show what we saw tonight, the differences between the different classrooms um, with some, um, some narration and some uh, art cards and things like that that explain um, the facts age of the building, how many students, current enrollment, uh, you know, all the facts and figures on video for folks. So just wanted to get the committee's thoughts on moving forward with something of that nature. I think it's a great idea to move forward with it. I'm not quite talented in any of those uh, disciplines, so I would have much thought in that regard. But I do think that the more information we can, we can provide for the community, um, the better. And, uh, so I, I don't know what would be involved from a perspective of, of budget, what it would cost to uh, produce something like that, but it's definitely something I'm supportive of. Because if we don't get our message out and our findings out to the public and community, then you know, we've, we've wasted a lot of time. Any other thoughts? I like the idea of keeping them to short two sure. minutes just to kind of show the schools, not necessarily focus on a ceiling tile that might be stained, but you know, show the library, show the different uh, you know big big gathering spaces yeah. like you said oh, yeah. that's good. and you are the marketer person so you can tell us how to do yeah. that but I think that's important catchy quick uh, things to catch people's attention and factual you know, and factual. To make sure and that's that, the biggest part you know, show, of it so. I don't want to do a series of videos that just show all the you no. know the worst spaces no. in the schools we want to show the good bad no, no, no but it's just more of a for instance show um, the special ed class. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Right. That's, Just to see the that's what we're talking about when yeah. we're talking about clustering. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Yeah
And I, I think that the information that gets broadcast needs to be curated well because when we walk around this building, it's a very well kept building. So Absolutely. we also don't want to give people, or we don't want people to miss out from the discussions we're having about the programs and about, about those challenges. So that would be important because if you only see the video and don't hear the audio, you will say, oh, it's that's a, nice a really nice building. <laughs> And to that point, I do think that we want them to see some of the shortcomings, but we also want them to realize that uh, there's a lot of good things in these schools. Right. Exactly. Now, they may not be, <coughs> they may need some help to be changed or uh, altered, but there's a lot to start with in many of these buildings that we can build upon. And I think to give them the idea that everything is worthless is wrong. Correct. So we Correct. need to be positive about that. No, I, I agree. I think also it gives them. I think most presidents comfort knowing that tax dollars have been used mm -hmm. as judiciously as possible to keep, you know, things attractive. And I, I agree with uh, Renee on the discussion we had, just hearing Mr. Woods' feedback and others. There's a way to not have to watch to our video to hear all that. I don't know if this could be a transcript or something, bullet points pulled out so we can have some feedback from Absolutely. the educators. I think that's good for folks to, to see that too. I'm not sure what the solution is, but. Yeah. Any other thoughts on this? Yeah, just, uh, I know we all have, uh, there's a couple of letters that we received in our packets from a couple of people, and I don't know if you were planning on reading them out loud or not, but to Renee's point, there is a, a letter here from one of the educators in this building that talks specifically to what you just said, Renee, which is it said that I see that tonight's agenda includes a tour of Dodd. I assume it's partly to get a look at the overall condition. His concern is that over the past couple of days, many of the stained and missing tiles from active leaks have been replaced in various rooms, common areas, and office areas. While it's good to get these openings covered from a health code perspective, it does not give a true overview of the school's condition and the leaks that are occurring. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if the timing was just, it is what it is. But I guess I agree with Renee. I think we want to make sure we all have the right perspective of what the schools are on an everyday basis. So. I would just ask everybody to make sure you don't miss the two letters that we received, which are at the back of your packets. Absolutely. Yeah, so I think, absolutely, I think if we're going to do videos, we need to make sure they tell the, the true story of what we have in all of our buildings. It's a double-edged sword. You, know, you, you yeah, can't do the worst put forward, forward to work, you know, and it's, it's not accurate. And right. just showing all the great stuff is not accurate either, you know, right. I'm right. trying to be balanced. Yeah, but you know, he's talking about active leaks around the heating and cooling units that appear each time he gets a rainstorm, you know, with strips on the floor. So, you know, these are a lot of the things that we just can't see right. in a quick kind of an overview. So it's important that we make sure we have this kind of input from the people that use the building on an everyday basis. So, uh, you know, Mike and John, you guys were very valuable tonight. I want to thank you both for taking the time out of your, your personal schedules. But, uh, but it is important to understand what you see every day that we just can't possibly see in an hour tour. So thank you. Again, as we, as the subcommittee um, goes out and gets more input from our uh, teachers and staff and other administrators, maybe those are some of the points that we make sure that we incorporate the day-to-day -day stuff that we're not seeing when we're. When yeah, we're and, and I think it's important that you know, Jeff. I'm sure you're doing this, but you know, staff should know that we want to know what they what they really believe We're, yep. you know there, there's no repercussions here no one's going to be you know in yep. trouble because they talk bad about a particular building that's why we're here we want to understand what they're dealing with on an everyday basis so you know if people are watching please give us your honest input we need it yeah i sent an email to all employees all faculty and staff after our last meeting encouraging that yeah. and letting them know that they're I'm not sure where that group is in terms of developing a, either a survey or visit schedule, but <coughs> something would be coming forth. And it's important to express, you know, some of the things that you consider really important to your building. You know, is there a particular space that, like, the library at this school, we just couldn't live without X, Y, or Z. And then right. what are some of the things, like, the teacher expressed in that email that also are considerations and need to be addressed? So. I want to know the whole story. Yeah, I mean, the one thing I, I just want to throw out there on, on the roof for this building in particular, you know, the roof's out of warranty. We've known that. The roof fields, these are rubber membrane roofs on most of our schools. The roof fields are still good. Where you're getting the leaks are the seams and around the rooftop units that we have. And I know Rich is here. He's been chasing those leaks. We've gotten approval and, and 
have funded, you know, repair. So you typically pull out the seam, you repair, you patch it. So that's ongoing. You know, we try and do that to the extent we can. And, you know, it shows up in the ceiling tiles, certainly. And as Mike said, you know, we did invest quite a bit of money and time to replace ceiling tiles, at least trying to keep the place look good, but <clears throat> at the same time chasing the leaks. And I think, uh, you know, some of the leaks are windblown, rain-rich. And this yeah, it's, building. Uh, I mean, when you're dealing with a flat roof with different configurations, uh, different additions, I mean, uh, we'll get uh, we'll get a spot leak like what you see above your head uh, on a specific storm with a wind that blows out of the northwest and it won't leak again for three years. We see it again. You know, it's just like it's just the nature of the of the beast, and then you try to chase it down. So what we try to focus is on, you know, once it's a repetitive leak. Now, you know, the other thing too is weather. So in a, in a casual or natural rain, <coughs> it won't leak at all. As soon as you get an ice storm and there's a layer of ice on the roof, it can, you know, you get water that cavitates, it comes up under the flashing and it'll start leaking. It's like, it's like the, old, the old farmer's adage, you know, the wife would say, you know, why don't you get out there and fix the roof? Well, it's not raining today, it's not leaking. It's, it's the same thing with the school. It's like when, when we know the leak is there, we can't get out there and fix it. You know? And then when it's not raining, we can't find where the leak is emanating from. So it's a continuous investigation. And, and I can understand some of the teachers' frustrations because some of those areas are, are very elusive. And we try, some of it's going to require capital, uh, capital equipment replacement. So we're dogged about it. We've, we've had some successes over the last few years, and we continue to attack it. All right, so we'll have uh, work with staff. Maybe the timing isn't to do it right now. Maybe to do it further in the process after we get some more input from the teachers and staff to make sure that we can um, have some effective, um, good factual videos for the public. And, obviously can't and, and we do have the ability to do some of that in-house, even okay. as a student yeah. project. So it's not going to be a big cost. Okay. Um, we just need somebody with a good voice to narrate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that requires a lot of coaching. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can take that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 One of our subcommittees had its first meeting, I believe, tonight. And if we want to start with that group, um, the out of district group. So, uh, someone from that group wants to. We did, um, and uh, it's the subcommittee for visiting out of town facilities consists of <coughs> myself, Rich, Ann, and Matt Bowman, who wasn't here tonight. Um, I got I got challenged with being chairman of this committee. So thank you, Sylvia. So thank you, Sylvia. <laughs> Uh, what we've decided is we will meet again just prior to the next, uh, no, we're doing it on a Monday the 27th, correct? Yeah. We will have a meeting um, Monday the 27th at, the 27th at 6 o'clock at the town hall. We are developing a list of questions that we will provide, we will propose to facilities that we visit, um, primarily focused on the general gist of what our call is to do here and that is to determine different methods and ways in which communities have dealt with the problems that we're all dealing with. <coughs> Hopefully we're going to visit some schools that have had uh, project managers, uh, project reps, and different ways that they funded. Um, and I will open it up to you to make anything rich and Anne have both provided questions as has Jeff that we will put together on a list so that every school we visit we will pose the same or similar questions. We're going to try and look at schools which are as similar as they can be to our town and, and our project needs. Am I missing anything? No, no I'm missing, you know, we wanted to see both new schools and renovations. Renovations, yeah. Uh, so that uh, we got a feel for um, those school systems that decided to do a renovation. How did they come to that decision? How did it look when they were done? How did they handle some of the uh, program issues that may have been in the buildings ahead of time. What do they do with swing space, for instance, right. Howie? And all of those questions. So we're not going to look for what kind of heating system to use right. and what kind of air conditioning and what kind of roof. That's not our purview right. at this point. Once we have a plan, then maybe we can go and look at it for that. But for this time, it's just trying to find out how the process works. 
and we said we would come back with some kind of a public <coughs> or slide program to share with the with right. the whole group so that we could give you an overview. Great. And to Jeff is going to uh, provide us with a list of some yeah. possible schools for our next meeting. And most of the time, our visits will be during the day, so um, we'll work that out. We, we sort of retired people have time during the day. Excellent. Nice. No, but not bad. But not bad. <laughs> That was important. It was yeah. important. Conversation. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, any update from the RFP committee? Yeah, so we haven't met yet, okay. but we're going to, uh, I guess, I send an email to Arnett with a schedule and time. Um, we're planning to meet next Friday. Okay. Um, and then again, once more before our next meeting here. Next what date meeting. is next Friday, Chuck? 24th. 24th. 7 o'clock at the town hall. Now, Will they need a clerk for that meeting? Probably. Can tell me. I assume so. I mean, they need a clerk, need a clerk for that meeting. I'm sorry. Do they need a clerk for their Friday no. meeting at the town they, hall? They will need minutes for the meeting. Yeah. Actually, I have a dinner plan. And we'll also need an agenda. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah if you want to we'll shoot me an email, we'll take care of all that. Uh, I'll coordinate all of our network. Right. And then okay, the, uh, the intent is to have a, a draft of the RFP for a meeting on the 3rd, the Excellent. full committee meeting on the 3rd. Great. Thank you. And then in terms of the um, input sessions with uh, all the various schools, um, just speak on behalf of um, Jen and Rich and I are going to huddle after tonight's meeting to align some calendars, so we're hoping to put our first uh, kind of an organizational meeting on the books, hopefully it's hopefully next week as well, based on schedules. And I think after one organizational meeting, we'll be ready to um, start um, you know, going out, getting those scheduled. And I believe, Jeff, you said um, Marlene would most likely be the staff. Yeah, we, we've talked perfect. about it. She's Excellent. definitely going to be the liaison for that. Okay, perfect. So we will work and coordinate uh, that as well. So we are anxious to get those started. And again, those will be um, also during the day, those sessions anyway, um, at the schools, hopefully shortly after school hours, if that's what Marlene advises us in order to make it convenient for staff and teachers to attend. All right. Okay, this time I'd like to open up for anybody in the public who has any comments, questions. <coughs> As far as the school visiting out of district, I'd mentioned this to Rich when we were walking around, but just asking what the other schools have maybe done that have used a little bit of a flexible day schedule to give them some flexibility in their spaces of some grades or options to start earlier in the day, and maybe stay a little bit later. Like I know with some of the elementary schools, there'll be a couple families who will pick either um, like Chapman or Doolittle because for their work day in their family, that school starts an hour earlier, so they will go out of district for that option. So, I mean, maybe that's something that works with staffing and parking and which space is your flex space or swing space during this to consider um, how you could use the buildings, not just with um, different grade levels, but over different Jamie, periods could, of time. Could you stand up? I oh, I'm so you, sorry. I need to get this on the microphone, please. Okay. Do you okay. need me to? Uh, did you know? Did you miss a lot, Jerry? <laughs> 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 Take two. <laughs> she got it all. And parking and I was saying, and as schedules. opposed to, or in addition to looking at flexible um, space for grade levels and things like that, uh, but maybe think about how the the day could be used more flexibly. Um, I'm not sure. The teacher's contract is a year out, maybe? Or I don't know when they'll start negotiating, but those would be the kind of conversations you'd probably need to have of knowing you know, what kind of options. If some staff and classes started at seven in the morning and some had the option you know, at a different school or different, you know, maybe just in a flexible period of time, not necessarily for all of the future that some schools went until five o'clock, or at least have Certainly, that that's a question we can ask. But right. as far as the flex time, that is a school programming issue more right. than, a, than a facility issue. So um, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but as it might apply to using the facility mm -hmm. spaces, um, that might have some bearing. But I think the question about flex time, in my opinion, right. you can all disagree with me, but becomes more of a programming issue for the school. Right. Um, I and mean, so my point was 
while you're in this interim period of how would you, what do you do with the kids in the meantime if you're renovating somewhere? Right. Okay. Having that type of flexibility okay. that it let you have some students of a population in an, earlier in the day okay. as you're tapering throughout the day. So they're not all there all day long. Got it. Got it. I mean, okay. it's convoluted, but you know, that's kind of nope. how we do things in Cheshire. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Anybody else? Any other comments or questions? Mm. To Rob's point earlier, there is just um, in your packet a couple um, pieces of correspondence, so if you haven't looked at it, um, definitely um, worth taking a look at as well. Uh, okay, then I'll open it up. Um, as, as part of the kind of questions, comments from uh, members of this committee, I, I would like to um, want to officially welcome Jeff to the group, our newest member, and if you wouldn't mind just telling telling the group, sharing with the group, we all did it at the beginning, no problem. a little bit about yourselves. <laughs> so I didn't even have it on the agenda earlier, share. I didn't want to, uh, but if you could just uh, share with us a little bit about yourself or how this um, So happy Jeff Pingar, I live uh, in Cheshire, obviously, with my wife Keisha, I have three boys. Um, third grade, fifth grade, eighth grade, um, very involved in youth sports in the town. I'm on the board, Cheshire football, basketball, um, baseball too. Uh, I own a business in town on the south end. Um, you know, I'll be honest, I grew up in Connecticut my whole life. I didn't know Cheshire was a town until I was in my 20s. I grew up in Fairfield County, and this was kind of like a distant farmland um, for us. But, uh, you know, we got married and lived in Hamden, and we looked for a place to raise our kids, and Cheshire's been awesome. Um, we absolutely love it. Our kids go to Doolittle and here, and uh, it's been great to be part of the town. It's like a small town involved. Um, so I'm excited to get involved. and. Uh, I'm very proactive and very opinionated, so I apologize in advance with that, but, um, okay. you know, it is what it is. So, thanks for having me. We're happy to have you. Thank you. Anybody Or questions? as Anne-Marie said, you're sitting next to the right guy. Yeah, that's no, right. I said I should separate the two of you. That's what I said. You can arm wrestle for a minute. Other questions from this very group? nice, by the way. Comments? <laughs> okay, I think our tour Hi, everybody out, huh? Tucker, we're done. Yeah. All right, so uh, before we adjourn, just uh, to confirm our next meeting, um, which is the third, um, is at Chapman School. So we need to Chapman. I'm sorry, is that a change? We changed that. You changed it. Sorry. It's, right, it's where the Cheshire are we High School Library. Okay. okay. So February 3rd, Cheshire High Library. Correct. Seven <coughs> seven. So those are just flipped. Is Chapman now the following week, or is it all changed? Cha yes. So Cha well, Chapman. Switch so. with where the high school was. I think it is. Oh, the right, so it's a flip of those two. Yes. Yeah. We'll, we'll send the revised. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually posted in the, it is in the shared system. folder. Sent out an email and we'll that keep we'll keep that update. But our net would always send that yeah. the uh, agenda in advance. And can you get that uh, picture blown up of the property with some yeah. Yeah. property yes. lines, wetlands, etc. We'll take care of that for the next meeting. Yeah, it'd be great to have them all. Yeah, as we went to the school, I think yeah. we could do it. Yeah. Collect them all. Yeah, beyond just having the high school, when we're at the high school, have yeah. the high school one and all the other schools. Yeah. We start yeah. to talk about Dodd versus Doolittle. Yeah. Yeah. It would be good to have. Do we know the I teach this? Yeah. All right. No, I, I am a person. Second. Oh, okay.